All right, good morning. Um, Andrea, how many people do we have on right now? So we have 944 people on the uh, town hall meeting uh, webinar. So we may hit our max at 1,000. And, um, um, and so since we're almost full, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, so welcome to our uh, first ever virtual town hall meeting. Uh, I'm going to cover three topics this morning. First, uh, briefly cover the coronavirus pandemic and our communication strategies connected to the pandemic. Second, our uh, reopening plans for the summer and fall. And third, our financial situation and budget plans. We have uh, six survey questions planned where we will seek input from you. Um, let me reassure you, your answers will be anonymous. We can't track who says what, so we want you to be completely honest when you answer those questions. The first one uh, is an easy one, uh, and uh, so we want to see what group of people are participating today, and so please uh, uh, check one of the six boxes there. If you, uh, if you don't fit into the staff, faculty, administrator, student, or parent of a current student category, click community. And uh, everybody do that in the next uh, 30 seconds, and then we'll show you how this works. Fifteen seconds, and we're going to close out the response. All right, Andrea, close that out, and let's put the poll results up. And so you can see uh, who's on the call. We have uh, 572 staff members, 269 faculty uh, members, uh, 60 administrators, 25 students, 22 parents, and 12 uh, in the other category. All right, very good. Um, all right, so after my presentation, which uh, I hope will be less than 30 minutes, we will take questions on any topic, and here's how to do that. So uh, you do that by finding the question and answer feature on Zoom. It's usually either at the top or the bottom. Uh, on, on, on the computer I'm looking at, it's at the bottom. On a tablet, it's often at the top. And you will uh, type in uh, questions there. There are too many people on the webinar handle this any other way. And so again, uh, uh, Susan Shaw, who is helping me today, our Vice President of Communication and Marketing, will read the questions uh, at the end, and then I will answer them or kick it over to somebody else, our provost or one of our vice presidents, our chief financial officer, David Hall, etc., cetera, uh, to provide answers. If you would rather uh, send an email to me directly. You can do that at uh, president at missouristate.edu. We will get all those questions answered uh, in the next couple of days. Um, and then the other thing to know is we're recording this and it will be uh, posted on the uh, university website. Um, okay, here we go. Let's, uh, Ryan, let's pull up our timeline slide and uh, we'll jump into our first topic. So on, uh, on March 12th, which is uh, uh, 10 weeks ago tomorrow, the uh, first case of coronavirus was discovered in Springfield, and we canceled Friday classes, starting spring break a day early. On March 20th, eight days later, I began working almost exclusively from home, as did many of you, as the coronavirus pandemic was upon us. Um, as you remember, spring break was extended to allow time for us to transition to an alternative delivery of our classes. Most of our students moved out of residence halls, all but five buildings were closed. And we began supporting our students through a variety of ways from calling campaigns, to keeping a residence hall open for those with nowhere to go, to altering policies, extending deadlines, and most recently uh, forwarding them money uh, through the CARES Act that we received from the federal government. 
In the middle of all of this, on April the 1st, the state withheld $7.6 million of funding that was allocated to Missouri State University. After that, uh, commencement was postponed and many other events moved to a virtual format or were canceled. You all persevered, rising to the challenge, over 2,400 students mentioned a specific faculty member or staff member by name in a survey who went out of their way to help them. So let me just say well done folks and uh, thank you for, for your good work in that regard. And I know you did this even though this was a very unsettling time for all of us and uh, frankly part, I believe, part of the anxiety experienced was a result of uncertainties. How long would this pandemic last? How many people would, would contract the disease in our community? What would it do to the university and our employment there were among the unknowns and those questions are still unknown. Uh, throughout the last 10 weeks, uh, Ryan, pull up the next slide. Uh, throughout the last, uh, the next 10 weeks uh, and before, when the coronavirus was something far away in Asia, we tried to communicate what we were thinking and doing, as well as the rationale uh, behind the decisions being made. So, so on the screen now is a list of our major uh, communications. Uh, you see we began with the China travel cancellation, uh, March 12, the canceling of classes, the extending spring break, uh, our first positive test happened on March 21. Uh, our our uh, transition to a new workforce, event cancellations, uh, update on student support, the distribution of CARES fund, and then uh, we've moved into communicating about campus uh, reopening. The most recent communication came yesterday in a cliff note setting out various return to work policies. We also did a letter to students yesterday, followed by a, a video on our academic plans for the fall. Uh, all of our employees should have been copied on that communication as well, so that you know what students are receiving. Early on, we established a website, which is updated regularly as a place you can go for information. So here, here's what it looks like at times, and you'll uh, um, stay on that first slide there, Ryan, and um, go back one. There we go. Uh, you know, and so you'll see uh, typically my cliff note is going to deal with this situation, whether it's uh, the resulting budget shortfalls, whether it's a return to campus, whether it's a particular policy, um, and then uh, you can also click on the red box, COVID-19 updates underline. If we do that, you'll go to the uh, COVID-19 webpage. Let's move to that. And so, for example, this is what that looks like. It announces the virtual town hall, uh, uh, the new return to campus policies on there. Uh, on the left, there are a variety of frequently asked questions that you can click on for students, for faculty, staff, uh, et cetera. Uh, again, let me encourage you to read Inside Missouri State every week. It, it's important always. It's particularly important now as we're in a, a time where change is occurring very rapidly. Uh, I would encourage you to read the cliff note every week. It is going to be something specifically related to what we're working through. And then regularly take a look at the website. You go to the home page, you click on it, and you will see uh, the updates uh, that are the, uh, important and whatever our latest information on the pandemic is. Uh, but, all right, so here's our first, uh, here's our first real survey question for you. Uh, we want to know how we're doing because we know we can always do better. And so the question is, how helpful have the university COVID-19 communications been in understanding temporary policies, announcements, processes, et cetera? 
So let's take uh, 30 seconds on this and uh, give us your feedback. All right, five more seconds and then we'll close it down. All right, done. Let's pull the results up. Okay, uh, good. 79% um, uh, uh, are pleased with the information uh, that we are providing and 20% uh, saying we need more information. Again, we will work to do that. Uh, sometimes in the middle of uh, making decisions and, and doing planning, uh, sometimes communication gets left behind. So we will do our best to continue uh, to plug information in. And hopefully now that you know the main sources that these are gonna come from, they're typically not gonna come in an email directly to you. They're gonna come weekly through uh, uh, the Inside Missouri State and they are going to always be on this webpage. And so again, we will work on continuing the communication piece. All right, uh, let's move on now to our uh, reopening plans. And so uh, our plans are to be reopened in the fall uh, albeit modified in ways to decrease the risk of infection, uh, again, with the caveat, assuming the virus allows that to occur. I want to spend a moment and talk about why we have made that decision. First, Springfield has done tremendously well in combating the disease. This was the data that was up on the Greene County Health Dashboard. You can track that uh, uh, as well anytime you want. Um, and, and so as of Tuesday, uh, we only had 16 active cases in a, in a county of 300 plus thousand people. Um, the only eight people had died. Uh, six of them were very early on, all from the same nursing home. All of the deaths have been uh, very early in this process. Uh, I was on a Mercy call yesterday um, and earlier a Cox call this week. There are only three people hospitalized, none on a ventilator. And so Springfield has done very well uh, in managing the disease and is now our city is in the process of reopening. Um, every university in town, our community college, our our public school districts in the area, everyone is moving back towards reopening because um, our leadership in the community and in our county have managed this uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, second, we believe we can do this safely if, num if these kind of numbers persist. So we're modifying our class schedule to add internet, Zoom, and blended classes. We've established more first block classes. Uh, we will have more classes over a longer day. Uh, we have reassigned classes to larger rooms. And the goal is to spread people out over the day and to spread people out within buildings. We'll have limited events. We will have a different housing check-in and living plan. Uh, we will have a robust testing policy uh, we will have a mask policy for high risk areas. We will add plexiglass where appropriate. That's in process right now. We are creating new cleaning and sanitation procedures, new sanitation stations. Um, and um, we'll have many one-on-one -on -one meetings such as advising sessions that will move to Zoom. Third, most of our students want a residential experience and seated classes. Uh, if we were to fail to offer that, given the coronavirus numbers in Springfield, frankly, we believe uh, that decision would decimate our campus and literally hundreds of jobs would be lost and our recovery could take years. Fourth, um, if we only opened online, many students would put off coming 
to college. Some of these, uh, and some of these students, frankly, I worry about those um, in our lower socioeconomic groups would never go to college anywhere and their lives would thus be changed for the worse. Um, like every enterprise in our state, we must reopen to survive, but we are committed to doing it gradually and as safely as possible. And we are contingency planning in case the virus has other ideas. For example, you've seen uh, reported, I suspect in the Chronicle recently that four or five universities are, are planning to end seated classes at Thanksgiving and, and do the last couple of weeks online. That's a contingency we're planning if that becomes necessary. Uh, so again, we're contingency planning because the, the coronavirus itself is gonna have a huge say in, in whether our plans uh, come to fruition or not. I would give you, I would tell you all reopening decisions have not yet been made. We are making them on a timeline where they're both required to be made, like what does our academic schedule look like? We needed to have that in place because students are registering for fall classes. Um, we're working on the housing piece now because housing assignments will go out um, in June. And so we're, we're making decisions as they need to be made um, and we'll communicate them as soon as they are made. I cannot tell you what our testing policy will be in the fall, uh, three months from today, because the availability, the kind of tests, the costs of tests will be different in August than they are now. Circumstances surrounding the virus are likely to be different than they are now. And so again, while we're planning for testing for the fall, uh, and we're planning on and we'll have ready the testing when our student athletes begin returning to campus next month. Um, we will wait and, and, and consider circumstances before we finalize those plans for fall. We have a masking policy out uh, that goes through the end of June because again, uh, circumstances may require that that policy be changed for July and the first part of August and again changed for the fall semester. So that's an overview of our reopening plans and where we are in the process. Uh, we've communicated many of those to you already, so much of that uh, will not have been a surprise. But let's pull up some survey questions here uh, to, to get some initial feedback on this. And so the first one is, um, which of the following safety precautions do you support? So do you personally support that you would do and that you would want your coworkers to do? Uh, and you can check as many as apply. Wear a mask in a designated locations, practice social distancing, participate in training, uh, participate in random testing, uh, or none of the above. Then you can scroll down and the second one is, are you concerned for safety as you return to work? So we'll be gradually returning to work over the summer. Um, for example, we're, we're doing it slower and more gradually than either Drury or, uh, or Evangel are doing it. I think Drury's return to work day was today. I think OTC's return to work day was Monday. Um, we, are, we are doing it in a more decentralized way with uh, divisions and units and cost centers managing that uh, over the course of the summer. And so are you very concerned, slightly concerned, neutral or not concerned? Plug that in. And then the last question, given what you know about the university's return to campus, what do you think about the pace of reopening? Too slow, too fast, uh, uh, passionate, let's see, too slow, too fast, reasonable pace. I don't think the university should reopen this fall. I think we should be open now. So you can fill in all three of those questions. We'll take about 30 seconds to do that and then we will report um, the polling results.
All right, five more seconds. All right, Andrea, shut it down and let's show the results. Okay, in terms of safety precautions, uh, good, uh, good support for uh, uh, masking and social distancing, uh, 60 to 65% support on training and testing. Uh, all right, very good. Like, can you scroll the next question up, Andrea? Or do I need to do that? All right. Uh, lot, lot, lot of spread on, uh, on question number two, and that's good to know. Uh, I, I was very interested in these responses because I need to, to have a sense of what you're thinking. And so about a third of you are very concerned about coming back to campus, and I understand that completely. Um, and then about 53% are in the slightly concerned to neutral category and 14% not concerned. Thank you for sharing those feelings with us. That's helpful, that will be helpful in planning. Uh, and then uh, uh, about our return, too slow, 3%, too fast, 8%, reasonable pace, 83%. Don't think we should reopen 5%. Think we should be open now 2%. I, I appreciate the vote of confidence on that. I think our leadership team uh, recognized that we had people completely across the spectrum in terms of concern about what was going on. And uh, we've tried to take uh, We've tried to take everyone into account in the pace that we've used. I appreciate those responses. All right, we're gonna go to the last piece of this and I may not hit my 30 minute rule and I am gonna apologize in advance. So probably gonna end up taking 45 minutes because it's likely to take me 15 minutes or so to get through the budget slides. Let's, but let's get started. Um, all right, so our final topic is budget. The uh, coronavirus pandemic is decimating state revenues. Uh, Ryan uh, DeBoof put this slide together for me. This is uh, sales tax and uh, income tax, primarily revenue just from April. And so in April a year ago, the state brought in $1.59 billion. This year, a little less than half of that. Um, we will see similar revenue impacts in May and June. Um, this has already resulted in the withholding I mentioned earlier, $7.6 million. <clears throat> 7.1 million came out of the Springfield FY20 budget. Uh, additional withholding is expected both this year and next year. I was on a call with Governor Parson this morning and he specifically said, we are going to have additional withholding likely to occur in June of this year. I'll come back to that in a minute. The legislature did pass a budget about 10 days ago. Uh, they uh, reduced spending by about $600 million, uh, but double that amount needs to be cut according to the governor this morning. They're looking at a at a $1.2 billion reduction for next year. So even though we escaped another round of budget cuts from the legislature for the FY21 budget, we know reductions in state funding will occur. We just don't know yet how much they will be. <clears throat> but the terms drastic and huge were used on the call this morning. We do expect those uh, reductions to be announced before our budget year begins on July 1st, and I'm appreciative of that. If we know the extent of the reductions, it helps us plan for next year. We also know fall enrollment will decline. Uh, national sh surveys show at least 10% of students are plan planning to attend a four-year college are likely not to go. Some studies show more than that. We were already planning for an enrollment decrease of 834 students. 
given the demographics of Missouri, as well as the large senior class that just graduated. And so between appropriation reductions and enrollment decline, um, lost my place, hold on a second. We are expecting a reduction in revenue of at least 16 to $20 million for FY21, again, which begins July 1st, 2020. Although the honest answer is it could be more than that. Um, our university is not alone in having to manage revenue reductions. Uh, I've asked Ryan to keep track of uh, uh, what other universities are doing. These are some of the universities that have already announced uh, salary reductions, furloughs, layoffs, uh, and you can see it is impacting major universities all across the country. For example, the University of Tulsa is on this slide, three hours down the road. They announced 800 staff furloughs unpaid for two months for this summer about a month ago. Um, and, uh, and so again, it is widespread. I, I would be surprised if every university in America, maybe with the exception of some of the Ivy League schools and, and schools of that nature, uh, are going to be managing through major budget reductions just like we are. In our own state, uh, the University of Missouri uh, has already announced um, uh, a variety of budget decisions. They've announced almost 900 furloughs, 78 layoffs, almost a thousand salary reductions. They are ballparking budget reductions of 3%, 12%, and 25%. Um, that was um, uh, reported yesterday in the Columbia Tribune as a result of a board meeting that the University of Missouri had. Um, and their chief financial officer announced that the 3% option, the most favorable option, was the least likely scenario that they would be in. Uh, the University of Missouri at Kansas City has already announced a piece of what they will do. They're, uh, they're ballparking 12.5 to 17.5% reductions. Um, and most importantly, they've already announced that every employee earning between fifty dollars and $100,000 will see a 7.5% reduction in their pay. For employees earning over $100,000, they've announced a 10% reduction in pay, and that is for year FY21 that starts on July 21. I share, I share these things with you, not to scare you, but simply to let you know that everyone is managing through a very challenging budget year. You probably also have seen that two public universities in Missouri have declared financial exigency and are in the process of terminating employees permanently. We're all taking, uh, we are taking all reasonable steps to avoid these options. As you will see in the next slides, we have no plans to, um, to announce any kind of financial exigency. Um, how we decide what reductions, uh, um, so how do we decide what reductions to make? Um, and so I wanna show you the budget principles that were adopted by our board uh, on Friday of last week. This sets out that uh, for, for the budget beginning July 1, uh, these are the factors that will go into play. Do they generate potential savings? Uh, how will they impact the university's mission with academic quality and accreditation our number one concern? Uh, how will they impact employees and, and workforce morale? Uh, and then you see the others here. Let's go to the next slide. But we have said we will continue to uh, uh, have some strategic investment. Uh, and you'll see that as I go through uh, our budget slides. And um, uh, we remain committed, as does our board, to transparency in this process and seeking input from stakeholders. And so one of the ways we're going to do that is through the budget presentation I'm gonna begin here shortly. 
All right, so let's get into our budget slides. Um, here's the year that we're in. We've got six more weeks to go. Um, uh, and, and I would tell you, we were doing really well uh, until the pandemic hit us. Um, here's our, uh, our revenue. We had uh, 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 forecasted uh, um, $114 uh, uh, million dollars of uh, revenue through essentially tuition fees offset by scholarships. And uh, we, were, we had hit that. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, and this slide shows you our budgeted ex expenses. We're $191.8 million. Again, that first slide doesn't have the state appropriations in it. That's why you've got a negative number at the bottom here. Um, but um, we have worked hard to reduce expenses beginning in March, and we have been uh, successful. So what this slide shows you is what our estimated expenses will be through June 30th. And so we're estimating that we're gonna have saved about $6 million in, in expenses. Um, and we did that through intentional strategies like a hiring freeze, building closures to save utilities, cancellation of all travel, the creation of a two thirds pay policy. We now have 164 people that are not doing work. They are at home, not doing work, still receiving benefits, still receiving two thirds of their pay. That is helping us save money. We have voluntarily, voluntary pay cuts by our executive team over two months. That'll save over $100,000. We've postponed 133 maintenance and repair projects, et cetera. So we're working hard to save uh, money and reduce expenses uh, because we know there's a $7.1 million loss in state appropriations uh, coming. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so here's where you see that state appropriations decrease. We had expected to receive $83.2 million of state appropriations through the general revenue fund. We also get money through the lottery. Uh, they did a, a uh, um, they have reduced us so far by $7,088,032. I learned today there is likely to be an additional reduction. I don't know what that amount's going to be, but I've learned there's more coming. Again, this slide was prepared before that information came. Uh, and so when you look at that, um, and, and you go down to the bottom, um, we started the year, Keyshore always likes to ask this question, I know Keyshore is on the call, we started the year with about $63 million in operating reserve, which is held at Bank Corp South, drawing interest. We will end the year before this last, before the unknown withhold occurs, at about $57.5 million. Frankly, um, because we think the savings generated in, 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 in April, May, and June may actually be better than this. I, I was looking that our reserve would be 58 to $59 million as of June 30th. And, and now there's likely to be some additional reduction uh, from the state on our withholding. Uh, all right, again, Knowing what the reserves are help us budget for next year. So let's say hypothetically before the next withhold, we're at $58 million uh, in reserves, then we've got to figure out how much of that can we spend to help fill a budget hole of less revenue for next year. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so now we're talking about next year's budget starting July 1. Here, uh, let me just take you through this. The board approved uh, the fee resolution. And so we are increasing uh, tuition for Missouri undergrads by 2.3% for 4.6% for non-residents uh, and for graduates. Uh, we also had a 2.13% tuition increase 
Uh, for undergrads on the book from last year, we were not collecting. We are now going to collect all of that. And when you work through all of this, um, it generates $4.6 million of new revenue. Um, and that's after a reduction from auxiliary support. Our auxiliary enterprises help support the general operating budget. Uh, they are not going to be able to as help as much this year with an enrollment decrease coming. And so that's an offset. Let's go to the next slide. We know we have new expenses for next year. And so again, going back to the budget principles, there are some things we need to invest in. And so I see no scenario that we don't reward our faculty for their promotions. Uh, so faculty promotions, the full professorship program will continue. Uh, support for students through the um, transfer center, uh, as well as our, our Center for Academic Succession, Success and Transition. Those are key strategic investments we think it important to still make. They total $533,000 of new expenditure. And then we have things we can't control. We've got a compliance issue that we need to fix. Um, uh, we have employee and GA fee waivers. Those are a function of increasing tuition. Our police contract uh, has, a, has an inflationary increase. Um, there's some slight ad additional ongoing costs through a new contract on the maintenance and repair side. We do believe we can hold utilities flat with buildings closed this summer. Property insurance goes up. Uh, our IT and ERP contracts have inflationary increases in them that go up. Um, our pension system that we all are a part of is gonna go up. We have no control of that. That's almost $900,000. Um, and then uh, we were planning to do 2.9% or $2,900,000 of reduction spread across campus. We've gone ahead and executed those and so at the end of the day, when you, when you add the pluses and the minuses, we have almost $600,000 of new revenue, in part because we've done those $2.9 million of cuts. Let's go to the next slide. So as I said earlier, we were expecting a decrease in students of 834 students. Uh, you see that that... Uh, that's a $5.8 million in revenue decrease. We were 5.2 to the good. Now we're 5.8 to the bad. And so the net of that is $640,000 behind. We have done some additional tuition um, a specific college fees. There will be a fee beginning um, next year on the Macquarie College of Health and Human Services on the, and on the College of Agriculture. Half of that money stays in the college, half of it goes centrally to fund our operating costs. There's a $4 increase for, on the internet rate. There's a $14 increase for graduate internet rate. There's one new departmental fee, 80% of that stays in the department, 20% goes centrally. When you add though, that additional fee revenue in and factoring in the tuition increases as well as the new expenses and the $2.9 million of savings we've already done, we're at $1 million to the good. So let's go to the next slide. $1 million doesn't get us there. And so um, we anticipate needing to cut uh, somewhere between 16 and $20 million from last year's budget. Uh, and let me give you an example. If we got an $8 million withhold from the state, that's a, that's a little more than we got last year, plus we had 1,500 fewer students, that would re re result in a $16.5 million revenue shortfall. Why, why 1,500 fewer students? Uh, in part because um, we think fewer students are likely to come, maybe because they believe the experience will be different, maybe because they're afraid we won't finish the semester in seated classes, maybe because they don't want to take online classes, maybe because they've lost work or their parents have lost work and they can't afford to, maybe there's a fear of contracting the, the disease before a vaccine is made. 
there, there could be dozens of reasons students don't come. I think those kinds of reasons are behind the national data that says 10% or more um, uh, students are unlikely to begin in the fall. So again, just as a hypothetical, if we lost $8 million from the state, we had 1,500 fewer students instead of 834, that would be a $16.5 million budget shortfall. So how would we cut that? Um, here's the first 10 million. And, and essentially this has been decided. Uh, the board's given us the thumbs up to move forward on these cuts. So uh, the first number is the million dollars we've already saved through, through the, uh, the slides I just went through. And then we have frozen 68 positions for the entire year. Um, when we did the hiring freeze two months ago, we had 99 people in that category. Uh, 68 of those have been frozen for the entire year. 15 were given the position to move forward and 16 are in limbo or in purgatory as we wait to see what the numbers look like um, as to whether those can move forward or not. That generates almost $5 million of savings. And then we are planning to eliminate the internet incentive that faculty earned by teaching internet courses. Here's the rationale of that. Last year, uh, last semester, we ended up moving all of our classes to alternate delivery. Most went online. Um, over 80% of the faculty that were teaching those new internet courses didn't receive the premium. Uh, we have, in the fall, we will have about 30% of our credit hours online. So this number would be even bigger. The, we are contingency planning in case all classes have to move online. Um, we are doing all classes online this summer. We are frankly now working in an environment where a faculty member should expect as a part of their reasonable job that they are going to have to deliver classes through an alternative way, uh, typically online. Uh, and so uh, this incentive, which began about 15 years ago when we had no classes online, and it was to encourage people to begin that work uh, frankly, the circumstances of the world and our finances no longer justify its payment, and so it will cease. Then we have delayed opening the new residence, residence hall. Brian uh, Majors was very helpful in our working out, um, um, a, a putting that off because it will not be needed, and so that saves additional money. We're reducing our repairs and classroom budget updates by 25%. And then because we're not purchasing the new residence hall, that money will earn interest. And so this gets us to the first $10 million of savings. Let's go to the next page. How do we get to the, to the, to the, to the second $10 million of savings? So, um, um, Likelihood there is that we further deplete our ongoing repairs and upgrades budgets. The President's Enhancement Fund, which has about $1.8 million of ongoing money in it for uh, um, special projects, emergency kinds of funding gets reduced by a quarter. Frank's uh, academic equipment budget is reduced by three quarters. Uh, travel, all budgets all across campus is reduced by half. And now you see we begin to plug in reserves, $4 million. That takes us to the $16.6 .6 million of savings. That would get us to that scenario I shared with you of an $8 million appropriation decrease along with a 1,500 student decline. Frankly, that may not be enough. And so where do we go uh, beyond this? Uh, and and here's, uh, here's where uh, we're gonna, um, uh, this would be our, our last resort. Uh, and so we've got an option here and we're gonna ask you all to weigh in on this. Let me explain it slightly. Um, if we, um, so much of our budget, over 70% is personnel costs. And so now we begin looking at personnel costs. Option number one would be 
uh, layoffs that would generate after we paid state unemployment about $3.3 million. That would require layoffs if a person was making $50,000 plus benefits, that would require 53 people to be laid off. That would then generate the $3.3 million. Most of those people will be, would be in the staff category. Um, and, uh, and so that would get us to the 20 million on option one. Instead of layoffs, uh, if we did a furlough system, which you've seen many of the universities have already announced, uh, this furlough that, that is costed out on the slide here, I mean, there are literally hundreds of, of, of variations that you can do, and I'm not saying this is the one that we would do, but this one would say any employee making uh, between $40,000 and $100,000 would be furloughed one day every other month or six days. That's the equivalent of about a 2.2% salary reduction. Any employee making $100,000 or more, including me, would be furloughed 12 days next year or one day a month. That's the equivalent of about a 4.6 or 4.5% uh, reduction or twice the above. Um, that would generate right at $3.4 million. And so you see that that gets us to $20 million. What would all this do to our reserve? Well, that, uh, um, we were at 58 million. I'm presuming we're going to get another 5 million withheld by the state. That would bring us down to 53 million. 4 million here would bring us down to 51 million. And then if we're above 20, I think the likelihood is we plug in additional reserves. And so uh, if we were at uh, 23 million in, in reductions, then we're, we're down at 48 million in reserves. Our board has set a, a floor that we need to keep $40 million in reserves for in case we have to make payrolls, that would pay three payrolls. And so um, 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 we need to hold some reserve in reserve because frankly, FY22 uh, could also be a challenging year. Let me stop there. I know there are lots of questions about all of this, some of which I'll be able to answer and some which have not yet been decided, but I want you to weigh in on the furlough option. And so here's our last survey question. And before you vote, wait for me, before you vote, only employees vote on this question. If you're a community member, a student, a parent, please do not vote on this question. This is a employee only vote. Here we go. If we reach the point in the budget process where we are forced to implement furloughs or layoffs, which is your preference? We're gonna do 35 seconds, vote now. Fifteen seconds. <clears throat> okay, here's uh, here's your answer. 88% uh, rolled in with layoffs, or excuse me, furloughs. 88% uh, prefer furloughs, 12% prefer layoffs. Um, that's about uh, where our, how our, uh, both our academic leadership and our administrative leadership team broke down as well. Uh, again, I appreciate that feedback as we uh, work to figure out uh, how we manage this really very challenging budget year coming up. All right, with that, it's time for questions. I went too long, I apologize for that, um, but I thought all this was important information for you to have. And so 
I uh, am going to turn it over for um, uh, Suzanne to uh, manage uh, the questions for our team. Suzanne? Okay. We have a lot of questions. I thought we might. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna stay here as long as we need to to answer questions. Okay, so I have been writing as quickly as I can, kind of pulling them and grouping them. So um, we'll start initially with cost savings since that's just where we've been. So the okay. first question was, uh, will furloughs include faculty? Yes. Uh, what positions would be affected by the layoff if we had layoffs? So they are, they are likely to center on staff if they had to be um, uh, layoffs. Obviously, our tenure and tenure track faculty are immune from that. And so primarily, we would be evaluating every department uh, in for, for, for continued reductions uh, in personnel. I would say if we have to go the layoff route, uh, because we've already reduced our force by, I think, about 170 people over the last uh, four years. If we did another 50 reductions, we would have essentially reduced our workforce by 10%. And that's a significant decrease. And frankly, that's one of the reasons I lean toward the furlough side as well. And it shares the pain equally among uh, kind of everyone. So with regard to uh, faculty being furloughed, how do you address that when they have uh, classes they are teaching and preparing for throughout the week? Yeah, that's, a, that's gonna be a challenge. Other places have done it. I don't have specific answers for you, but no, that would be something that would be uh, worked through uh, our academic leadership side. Would you allow employees to move to 75% during this time? That's an option. Would this be voluntary? Uh, um, it, it could certainly be voluntary. Uh, again, you know, if we're looking at ways to minimize the, the really awful personnel kinds of decisions, um, you, you know, that's a piece of how layoffs could be managed is that more people are engaged and you, re and you reduce the, the number of people working uh, 100%. Okay. Will there be a buyout offer for those near retirement or some type of retirement incentive this year? None is planned at this point. Uh, will there be more aggressive fundraising to offset the budget cuts? Um, it is almost impossible to raise money to fund ongoing operations of, uh, of, of uh, to fund ongoing operations. And so how we will rely upon our foundation would be to help us on those capital projects, scholarship projects, um, uh, strategic investment projects like the Idea Commons, um, uh, which they just invested in. Um, and so I don't think it's reasonable to expect the foundation to raise money for ongoing operations. I do think it's reasonable for the foundation to raise money to help us get through this in a variety of strategic uh, ways. Okay. Um, faculty, there are promotion and pay raise opportunities for faculty that don't get cut, but staff have to take pay cuts, hiring freezes, and no promotions. Is that fair? You know, uh, what we do, uh, our primary mission is, uh, is an academic mission to teach uh, our students and to prepare them for their careers. And so, um, um, I think it critical that that remains our number one focus. And uh, that has been a board focus from the beginning as well. As we have worked on budget reductions, now this will be year five, our priority has been to uh, protect uh, the, the academic side as much as we can. Now, having said that, I think the question is not, uh, is not completely accurate. 
because uh, there's $2.1 million of internet premium that faculty were receiving as compensation. And so in this budget reduction, um, that goes away. And so faculty are impacted. Uh, about a third of our faculty teach online classes and that will be impacted. Um, on a furlough plan, all of our employees uh, making above $40,000, if that's the cutoff, would be impacted. And so we are looking at ways to fairly share of what is a challenging time. But I'm not gonna apologize for saying we're gonna work hard to protect as much of the academic side as we can. It's what we do. So uh, on that question, removing the online stipend for faculty puts cost saving on a small group of people. Will there be a review of, of these faculty um, where they were the ones taking a large percentage, where this stipend was a large percentage of their pay? I would hope that would happen ultimately. It is very unlikely to happen next year when we're looking at a, a $20 million uh, reduction in funding. Now, if on the other hand, the federal government steps in and fills some of that hole, then one of the things we would go back and evaluate is compensation, including the um, including those that, that uh, took a bigger hit than others. I would remind all our faculty on this call that two years ago, Frank and I put together a group to evaluate transitioning this pay into the base pay of faculty, and that committee came back with the recommendation that we not do so. I think that was an unfortunate decision, but I deferred to the will of that group. Um, again, if we have the luxury of doing that, we may, we'll try to look at it again. Um, but in a year where we could have 20 plus million dollars of reduction, it's not um, anticipated that it could occur next year. This is more of a definition question. What did you mean by compliance issues? Well, and so our, uh, uh, the Disability Resource Center um, needs to be able to continue to function uh, staffed appropriately. And we're combining, we, ha we had a disability um, evaluation split. And, and so we needed to pull those together to most efficiently do it. To do that, uh, we needed to put some additional funding in it so that we could meet our um, obligations under federal and state statutes. So compliance typically refers to a regulatory or a statutory obligation that that we're that we must meet. Okay, uh, I'm going to transition to safety and kind of faculty safety at first. Uh, I feel at risk as a faculty member. Can I request my students wear masks in the classroom? Can I refuse to teach if a student won't wear a mask? Um, so, so we haven't set a mask policy yet, and and uh, and so I don't have an answer for that but know that we will have a mask policy in effect for fall. Do we believe testing is adequate to support the numbers? So we have the ability, we were on a call this morning with Dr. Maggie, we have the ability to do 2000 tests. Uh, and we will be, uh, um, and we expect that ability to grow over the summer. And so as we think about testing our returning student athletes, testing other high risk groups, testing anyone who may have symptoms, randomly testing students in the residence hall throughout the year, we do have the capacity to do that now. And I believe that capacity will continue to grow during the summer. What happens when students who live in hot spots return to campus? So maybe from Kansas City, St. Louis or other places. So, so uh, we'll develop a return to campus policy for students, much like we rolled out the return to campus policy for employees yesterday. Um, a part of that will, will involve a centralized check-in to the residence halls, temperature taking, uh, questionnaire answering, potentially some testing. So no, that will be in the works. Our folks at housing are working on finalizing their housing policy now. Um, in terms of, of what we know about the disease, uh, and, and, and I would tell you I interact regularly with the Commissioner for Higher Ed, uh, other university presidents in our state, our community leaders, 
uh, Clay Goddard specifically, who's tracking health um, in, in our state, uh, the governor's office. Uh, the belief is the peak has hit in St. Louis and numbers in St. Louis will come down significantly over the next three months. Again, we're gonna be tracking all that, we're gonna be managing all of that and we will have policies that address students returning to campus and what is required. Okay. Do you feel that students will be any safer in the fall than they would have been in the spring? I think we know a lot more about the disease in the, uh, now than we did uh, two months ago. And I think we will know significantly more about the disease and how to manage it three months from now than we do now. And so, yes, I think we're in a much better position to manage this safely than we were on March 12th when one case literally shut down the entire community. Um, everything in our state is reopening gradually. Everything in our city is reopening gradually. Every other university, every other community college in our state is working on the same plans we're working on. We're getting feedback from our local experts like David Claiborne and David Magee and David Hall, and we're getting feedback from our community and our state and our nation, uh, including the CDC. And our goal is to reopen as safely as we can, given the, the knowledge that we have about this uh, uh, disease. Okay, so I'm gonna combine some questions into a, a big one, if you wanna take a drink. <laughs> How will we handle a COVID positive student who has been uh, diagnosed while on campus and have we designated a residence hall that will be used uh, to quarantine students? And, I, and um, can you provide more detail on what residential housing will look like? All right, so I'm gonna need some help on these. And so David Hall, be prepared to talk and uh, Dr. Cisco, you as well. Uh, let me first say we have desi designated a residence hall. Uh, that we will hold open to house um, students that develop the disease. It is Kentwood, is the furthest away from campus, has private restrooms, has, does not have the, the, the airflow that flows throughout the building. And so that has been determined. Um, uh, David, do you wanna talk about first about kind of where we are in the planning to the extent it's known in terms of how we would manage positive cases on campus? Then I'll turn it over to Dr. Cisco uh, to talk about housing to the extent that you're ready to share that. You bet. So um, we developed actually worked closely with Residence Life uh, whenever this first came up in developing a plan of what would occur whenever a student tests positive on campus, one that is actually living in one of our residence halls. So because of that, uh, we have those plans in place and uh, have that procedure. That's why we identified Kentwood and have worked through and in, in, in keeping it available throughout the, the next year. So what happens is from a practical standpoint is uh, as soon as they get identified, then uh, we get them moved over to Kentwood and we work with the local health department and with Majors Health and Wellness in making sure that they're getting tested. They have a food plan of how it is that they actually provide and take food over to them. And they have a process so that there's no other interaction with others. And uh, then the contact tracing is kind of the second part that goes with that to where that you have the health department is reaching out in order to identify anyone that they've had contact with so that they can ensure that they're self-quarantined if required as well as providing any follow-up testing as part of that. Uh, so they do have a, a plan that's very clearly laid out uh, in writing that uh, we're working closely with Residence Life and Majors Health and Wellness and the Greene County Health Department as part of that. Yeah, I know we haven't finalized our housing plans, but if you could share some of the, the themes or principles in terms of where we are. Certainly, I'd be happy to. Our folks in Residence Life are doing an excellent job planning for how we'll welcome students in the fall. For example, um, we're gonna extend the move-in process so that we won't have our traditional move-in day with thousands of people on campus all at the same time. Rather, we'll assign students a date and time starting on August the 9th, and uh, they'll move in slowly. 
throughout the week prior to campus beginning. Uh, we'll have a central check-in where students and the person helping them will get information that will be helpful to them about moving in. Uh, we're gonna have a private room option. So students who maybe aren't comfortable having a roommate could select that option to have a private room. Uh, that's uh, new, we've allowed returning students in the past to do that, but not our first time new and college students. Um, we're looking at all of our policies, for example, visitation, and we anticipate we'll have some changes there to reduce risk. We'll be altering some of our common areas so that students won't be able to congregate in large numbers in the lounges and study rooms. Um, there, there are a number of educational and best practices that are being put into place. Those are a few. Good, thank you. Um, Dr. S yeah, Dr. Cisco, on that, um, uh, what steps are being taken for communal bathrooms? Um, we're looking at, uh, of course, the cleaning protocol, and those will be um, enhanced significantly. And so uh, I would look to that. And a couple, a couple more while I have you on the air. Uh, will Boomer Meals uh, expiration be extended or refunded? Um, as you all will recall, we extended the Boomer Meals from the spring through the fall. So that, that is already posted on the COVID website. And Chartwells has been uh, very helpful working with us on that. Okay, and I think that's all for you right now. Great, thank, thank you. you. May not be off the hook yet. Okay. Um, we do have a student question. When will students find out when they were awarded money from the CARES Act? Yeah, so our goal um, is to get all of that money out by the end of May. And so I would expect a notification by the end of next week, but certainly by the end of May. Um, and we believe we have enough money to fund every application that we receive. Okay, this is uh, on classrooms. Will you please discuss plans for large classes, 200 to 300 students that take place in places like Carrington Hall? That's part one. Are faculty responsible for uh, making their own arrangements for these classrooms? And when will be, they be notified of how the schedule, what the schedule will look like this fall with regard to their classes and where they will be held? So I, I uh, uh, let, let's uh, unmute Frank and Matt. Uh, and uh, Frank, do you wanna talk a little bit about where we are in terms of academic scheduling and then have uh, 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 Mr. Morris talk a little bit from his perspective on the room assignment piece? Yes, <clears throat> we've been working for the last uh, two to three weeks, all the deans working with their department heads on how we would alter class schedules. And our primary concern at this time, since people were already registering for class starting in the middle of April, was to look at how their schedules would be affected by things. One uh, major change is Many of the smaller classes have been, used, have been moved to larger rooms so that we can distance people more uh, readily to fit uh, social distancing expectations that we would like to have. Um, we have a dramatic increase in classes that the modality of the instruction will be considered as blended. And to define that a little bit, Blended refers to the fact they will have face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, and roughly speaking, although this is not a precise number for all, they'll meet about half face-to-face -face and then uh, the other portion in alternative modes, uh, primarily internet or Zoom or various alternatives of that nature. We will have an increased number of uh, internet classes, and uh, that has leaned on some of our larger classes, which is where part of the question has arisen, uh, so that I anticipate when we're all settled down and it's uh, was still being put into the system in the last two days, 
that we will have about a 50% increase in our class sections over prior fall that are internet, uh, which will, as uh, President uh, Sparta has referred to, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% of our class sections and, uh, and in, enrollment in credit hours will be in that neighborhood of internet. Um, the largest classes in some cases are anticipated to split into two rooms and we'll have a Zoom transmission between the two rooms. We haven't worked at that finally in all cases of handling all of the large classes and certainly some of the uh, classes that are most challenging right now will be things like our laboratories and also our uh, music areas where we have groups together and how to deal with those. Uh, I haven't got final plans on those. Matt, what would you add in terms of scheduling rooms? Frank covered it very well with the different approaches with modified and blended, but for those large spaces and of course other classrooms, social distancing will certainly be important. So you're seeing um, uh, assignments made that give room for people to spread out I would encourage those folks who wanted specific information. Each college has a schedule builder there, certainly reaching out to them to be sure that that's being communicated well, because there's excellent collaboration occurring between space management and the provost's office, academic affairs. Good, Suzanne? Okay, and a couple more for Matt. Um, will classrooms be cleaned between each class or continue at one time at the end of the day? Our custodial staff, who I appreciate greatly and has been working very hard, they are focusing on classroom lounges, those high touch, high traffic areas. They're using hospital grade disinfectants that are EPA registered for COVID. Um, and specifically answering that question, uh, those spaces will be disinfected at least three times daily. Um, we are also looking at that class scheduling component of how we can spread out classes um, uh, timing wise so that disinfectant may occur. And we're looking at equipment so that we can certainly disinfect at a quicker, more efficient manner as well. Also, if I may, we are also, because we, our custodial staff is gonna be focused on those high touch, high traffic areas, light switches, door pulls, those types of things. We will also, I'm gonna take it to administrative council on Monday, but we will have a listing of chemicals that departments may order. So then that way you can have wipes or gloves or those types of products that you're needing to wipe down office spaces. As we gear our faculty, or as we gear our staff and our custodial staff to, again to those high touch areas. Okay, and Matt, more for you. Um, will cost centers be able to order cleaning supplies to clean computers and specialty labs between course times? So, or will that be handled by custody custodians? If I'm understanding the question correctly, supplies will be made available for order okay. by departments. Okay. Uh, will masks be provided to faculty, staff, and students? Karen McKinnis, our emergency preparedness manager, is working with all cost centers. They provide her who needs masks. She provides them masks. And another question still in your area, will custodians receive hazard pay? No. Okay. And I think that's all I have for you right now. In general, um, what steps are being taken to ensure safety of at-risk faculty and staff with pre-existing conditions when they are returning to campus? So, you know, as um, each dean was working with um, department heads and faculty in terms of assigning um, classes to teach in what modality for uh, for the fall. 
And so I, I'm confident that many of those folks have had their classes transition to an alternative delivery mechanism. Uh, for those that have not, for whatever reason, uh, there is a process that we have to go through to ask for that kind of accommodation. And uh, Rachel Dockery, could you address that and, and how someone would access that uh, uh, process? Sure. Uh, so, so that process is the same as our existing uh, disability accommodations process. This is true for um, employees, staff, and faculty. It's also true for students. And, and so anyone who has a pre-existing um, health condition, that may, in fact, include mental health conditions. Uh, they can work through um, our deputy compliance officer, Julie Holmes, uh, to go through the interactive process to see if a reasonable accommodation can be provided that still allows that employee to complete the essential job duties that are inherent in their position. That's key. Uh, they still have to be able to do their work. The same thing is true for students. For students who may have uh, an underlying health condition or concern, they can work through the interactive accommodations process uh, that is managed through our Disability Resource Center. Good, thank you, Rachel. Okay. Um, I'm going to, we have a lot of questions about the furlough, so I'm going to go back to that uh, okay. again. Can, the, and, and I'll just combine them. Number one, can uh, an employee use a vacation day for a furlough day? No. And uh, can you please distinguish between the difference between a layoff and a furlough? So in a, uh, in a layoff, someone stops being paid, stops receiving benefits, and is in essence no longer employed by the university except that we would hope at some point to have the ability to call them back to work. A furlough, you keep your benefits, you keep your ongoing pay, you would just lose a day of pay either once a month or every other month depending on which category you fit into. You remain an employee, you keep doing your job, except on the furlough day, you keep getting paid, you keep getting benefits. Okay, and, and I apologize, I, I jumped here. I had one last question with regard to the academic side. Have we considered uh, shortening the semester in any way? Uh, perhaps ending at Thanksgiving, uh, eliminating weekends or... Um, so, so we, everyone should know we're contingency planning, right? Everyone should know we're contingency planning because we don't know what the pandemic is going to look like in July, August, October, November, December. And so, you know, we're contingency planning. What if, what if, what if there's a big flare up this summer? How would we start? When would we start? We're contingency planning. What would happen if there was a giant flare up in December or late November? What would we do? And so, yes, the answer is yes. We are, we are planning that. We think it makes most sense to start on schedule, which I think is August 17th. Um, but we are contingency planning if we needed to move to a different delivery um, in, uh, as the cold weather comes for the last three weeks of, of campus, et cetera. We don't think it's a good strategy to, to make that decision today. Okay. I might add that all faculty, uh, as they prepare their syllabus for the class, have uh, been asked and guided in putting at least the basic element of their contingency plan for that individual class if a change had to be made in the middle of the semester or near the end of the semester, how would you approach it? Yeah, and, and, and the, the provost's office through the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning is offering significant training to help faculty be ready for that. I think we've got over 150 people already signed up for summer uh, programs to help them be prepared to deliver uh, a strong finish to their class should the last two to three to four weeks have to move online. Okay, uh, there is a question. Uh, how many, how much is in the bank for Missouri State and as a part of the university operating reserves? So uh, <clears throat> on June 30th of last year, 
uh, we had uh, $63 million in change in the bank. Um, we anticipate if there were no more withholds in the current year, we would have 58 to $59 million of operating reserve in the bank. If we get another withhold, say $5 million, for example, well, then that number goes down to 52 or $53 million. Okay, here's a kind of an easy one. Will there be a partial refund of parking passes since, uh, fa or since faculty and staff are required to work from home for one quarter of the year? Matt, I think we have a policy on that, do we not? That's exactly right. We, we're following our standard parking regulations. So someone can turn their parking permit in for a refund of the amount remaining uh, that they wouldn't be using. However, I, I would put in the disclaimer that if you have a blue permit, a designated lot permit, once that goes back to parking, you lose your place and you may have to go on the waiting list. Um, and again, with the parking office working remotely, you can mail in your parking permit. All right, Suzanne. Uh, jumping back to the furloughs again. So um, what flexibility is there on the furloughs? So would um, faculty and staff get to choose the days that they took for furlough? Would they take them over the entire year? Um, could they take them in, you know, one block? Uh, and, you know, could a faculty cancel classes on the days they wanted to furlough? Yeah, again, again we hadn't created uh, e either the exact furlough uh, strategy or, um, or, or the details behind it yet. Uh, frankly, we had hoped that we would not have to get to a layoff or furlough um, option. We'd hoped that, you know, that's why it's at the, the back end of the savings. I'm frankly less optimistic on that after being on the governor's call at nine o'clock this morning. Um, so we, so we haven't, uh, haven't firmed up all the details of how a furlough would work, nor have we firmed up all the details of, of where it would start. And so again, I would expect that policy to be put together and ready to submit to the board at our June meeting. Again, more to come on that. We will disseminate it widely. Can you please expand a little bit on how someone is labeled a non-critical worker? And does that mean, you know, and the stress that comes with that and, um, and for those who've worked for a long time at the university, should they feel at risk? Um, and, and I'm gonna get, uh, um, Ryan, are you, you, Ryan, you may be the best person to help me on this because you put that policy together. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, I'm gonna ask my chief of staff to uh, answer that question. I'm gonna give my chair to him so that he's on the video because we're in the same room uh, because he was involved in working with the state in putting our definition together, Ryan. <clears throat> We worked from guidelines established by the uh, uh, federal government. And uh, those were uniform guidelines used throughout the state in all areas of state government. Um, there is not a hard line on when somebody is determined to be a critical worker. I, it's been a month and a half since I worked on that policy. So I don't remember exactly all the definitions right now, but we did work from a uniform set of standards in determining that it looks primarily at um, there were there were categories of employees that could fit into particular duties on campus. It is focused at the top end at uh, uh, the the most critical of employees are those necessary to preserve the you know the physical plant of the campus to be sure that buildings don't burn down or deteriorate to be sure that uh, we don't have problems in the physical state of campus. From there, uh, you look at life safety and animal uh, animals on campus, and then we had to figure out what operations did we need to continue during this time to support students. So for example, when we were determining who our uh, critical workers were, um, many universities were shutting entirely down their campus 
and closing all residence halls. That was not an option for us because we had a, a certain number of students that didn't have anywhere to go if we kicked them out of the residence hall. So that, that opened up another set of critical workers for our campus because those students needed access to food. We needed to be able to keep the residence hall minimally staffed to support those students and things along those lines. Good, let me add a thought here. And, um, so, so, so let me, let me just uh, respond, uh, hopefully to the sense of that question as well. That was a great answer, Ryan, that I could not have given. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't reflect your value to the, to the campus, right? I, I mean, it simply was a designation of there's some people that have to work from here. So you can't work from home and uh, disinfect a residence hall. You can't work from home and make sure the powerhouse doesn't explode. You can't work from home and provide security to the university typically. Um, and, you know, be in the dispatch center, et cetera. So a lot of those designations were just people that had to work on campus to, to be able to do their jobs. All of our workers are valuable. Um, and, and so um, the fact that, that uh, whoever asked the question was designated a non-essential worker has, will have nothing to do, frankly, with with whether uh, any reduction in force occurs or your job is eliminated, it, it's not a factor. Okay. Um, we're gonna turn to athletics for a minute. Why are we bringing back athletes? What sports can they practice or play while enforcing social distancing? And what sacrifices are athletics making? So, um, <clears throat> Um, as we begin to gradually reopen, um, we will see probably beginning in June that many universities will open up things like weight rooms, training rooms, uh, um, the track, uh, for people to work out on their own. So don't expect any kind of, of competitive practicing of basketball or football, et cetera, to occur through the end of June. Um, so I think, I, 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 and, and that's within the spirit of, of, uh, of the NCAA regulations. The second thing I would say is athletics is, is got to manage their budget just like we're managing our budget. So for example, they're planning, they're already planning to lose over $600,000 of revenue as a result of the men's basketball tournament being canceled. They have to reduce their expenditures to match that reduction in revenue. They're expecting ticket sales, bear fund commitments, suite sales, et cetera, to go down. Again, I've told our athletic department they have to manage those reductions in revenue that the university will not have the ability to step in and fill that hole. Um, it is somewhat uncertain that we will play the football game with the University of Oklahoma. That would be another $600,000 reduction in revenue that again, the athletic department would have to manage. I hope that game gets played. University of Oklahoma wants to play that game, but we've got a we've got a contingency plan in case uh, case it's not um, not allowed to be played, and so athletics will be managing their own revenue shortfall, um, and uh, um, and and uh, are are already evaluating travel expenses, um, number of games played, uh, where games will be played, who who they're played, personnel issues. Uh, you're likely to see reductions on the personnel side in the athletic department. And so again, th they're expecting to have significant decrease in revenue and they will be managing that without uh, additional support from the university. Okay. Um, and, and I know we haven't come up with the furlough or layoff plan yet, but- Still you're, haven't come up with the furlough plan. Still, still haven't, but I think something for, for consideration would staff who were placed in two-thirds salary status in fiscal year 20 be exempt or reduced, Ray, furloughs, if Missouri State needs to implement furloughs in fiscal year 21? Um, no, if, uh, if in fact uh, there is a furlough plan that is rolled out, uh, anyone making above whatever the cutoff is, on the example I gave, it would be $40,000, anyone making above that amount would contribute. Okay, um, th this will be more of a, of a Matt question. Uh, are we looking at 
our air filtering systems, are they being cleaned? Are we adding new filters in that will help uh, uh, avoid the spread of COVID-19? Yeah, thanks for that. Again, I mentioned custodial, but I'm very proud as well of our maintenance efforts that are taking place right now. Of course, while the campus is quiet, our maintenance staff is going through the air handling units. They're inspecting them, they're cleaning coils, they're making sure that the humidity controls are operating properly. We're checking set points to be sure that temperatures are correct. We're making sure that the air flow rates are set at the maximum level um, according to standards specific for the spread of infectious disease. We're replacing air filters and gaskets. And so all of that is taking place right now and appreciate the great efforts that are, that are going on. Okay, um, so I notice it's 12.02. I wanna confirm with Andrea that we can extend beyond our 12. She says we can, let's keep going. <laughs> okay, I've kind of been grouping. We have a lot of questions. So uh, I'm trying to group them and, and pull out the ones that I don't think we've answered yet. Um, let's see. Um, and I apologize to our audience. Uh, Cliff mentioned that if in-person classes couldn't resume in the fall, that would result in hundreds of job losses. If we are forced to move online this fall due to the virus, do you anticipate that hundreds of jobs would be lost? No, I don't. Um, uh, what, what I was referencing there was if we were to announce now that we're gonna do only internet classes in the fall, I think the result of that would be we would lose a quarter to a third or more of our students. I think our incoming class would be almost none. And so um, in that kind of scenario, if we were to lose, now we're talking about losing $70 million of revenue instead of 20. Well, then, then the only way to manage that is through personnel reductions. Our hope is by doing everything we've been talking about today, that we're able to open uh, in a modified seated residential style and that, and that we will minimize job losses, hopefully to none as, as we move forward. Will telework continue to be available for those who are not needed to be physically on campus for their work to continue? Yeah, so, so I think one of the things that, that comes out of the pandemic is the realization that f many of us can work from home and so uh, our uh, cost center heads, our, our division leaders are empowered to make those kind of decisions in terms of to what extent can people work from home um, throughout the summer and, and continuing beyond that. And so again, that's, that's not gonna be a, a President Smart decision. That's a decision that's gonna be uh, decentralized and made by, um, by our supervisors to determine um, uh, to what extent can people work from home? I, I certainly would expect to, to work um, over the summer, uh, continue to work from home to some extent, and then be back on campus at other times. Um, and, and each vice president, each, each dean is empowered to make those decisions for their own units. If a student requested to defer for the year due to safety measures, how would Mo State handle that? Uh, I would say specifically, I'm, I'm adding on to the question, specifically with regard to scholarships that they might have been awarded, um, how, would that, how would that be handled? Yeah, it, it, whoever asked that question, that's a question that you need to send an email to the president's office on that email address that we gave, president at missouristate.edu, and we will get that to the right person to answer that question. Okay, I, I'm reading. I think we've answered a lot of questions. I think probably one of the, the big things are, are masks. How, um, why are we not requiring it in all areas? Why only in uh, certain areas? How will it be enforced? 
Um, and, and I think we've already answered that we will be, we will have masks available for faculty, staff, and students. We do, we, we do have masking available. Uh, David Hall, you, uh, I'll call on you in a moment to kind of expand on that so we, so we can uh, give kind of the latest piece. Um, I, you know, to some extent, there's a philosophy question here. And uh, as the chief philosopher of our university, I guess, it is my philosophy generally that you, that you should not create policies that cannot be enforced and that are not generally supported by the great majority of folks. And so um, I think it would be an unenforceable policy to require everybody to wear a mask every, every place they were on campus, frankly. When we looked at how you responded to a question earlier, the majority of people on this call, I don't think would support that. Um, and, and so what we've got to do is figure out where are the places that it makes sense to wear a mask um, and that we could enforce wearing a mask. And so, you know, if you had 50 people in a computer lab where they're all sitting side by side in, by um, uh, working on things, and you have to go through a door to enforce that. I think that's a policy that we both is enforceable and makes sense given the close contact uh, that, that, that that masking should occur. Um, given that we don't know what the, what the circumstances of the disease are gonna look like in July or August or September, I think it's just premature to make that decision today. <laughs> David, um, what would you say in terms of mask availability for people that would like them? Yeah, that's one thing we're trying to balance. First of all is, you know, what we're doing right now is we've, we've followed what the CDC guidance is, is um, they recommend um, that, um, that, you know, if you, you know, that, you know, you can wear masks it doesn't say that uh, it doesn't require people to, it really encourages social distancing. So that's what we focused on is we want people to social distance. In those cases where you can't do that, then we would encourage people to wear a mask. So that's really the way um, that we've structured our, our, our guidance that we've got. And again, that runs you know, up into um, you know, June is where we've gone so far, into July rather, is where we've gone so far. And then we'll evaluate and see what we need to do as we get closer uh, and really see what the conditions are like. As far as availability of masks, you know, that, uh, you know we do have masks available right now, but the style we have are surgical masks. So any of the employees that we have coming back to campus now, we're making those available to ensure that they have them to all the cost centers so that any employee who wants to have a mask that they can have that. Um, and that way that whenever they get in those situations where they can't maintain social distancing that they're able to wear those. The, you know, it's really, we, we don't have the capacity to be able to provide those to every single person to be able to, you know, every single student, every single person that came onto campus this fall, we just don't have a supply to be able to do, you know, 25,000 people and certainly at an exchange rate. Now we are looking at what options we've got, um, but again, we don't want to be taken from our medical community. So that's where we're looking at the concepts of cloth masks, things like that, and certainly encouraging people if they've got that ability to, to be able to use those. That's what I use. Uh, I wash it. I I have two of them so that way I can wash one and then I can switch out and I can wash another one. Okay, thank you. Who will, uh, will there be any regulations on the fraternity and sorority houses? Dr. Cisco, what do we know about uh, Greek life for the fall? Have we gotten input from the chapter houses? Uh, we are working, of course, with, uh, with our fraternity and sorority community, and we'll help to educate them. But as you all know, we do not own their houses. So uh, their corporation boards or the folks that they rent the houses from uh, will be responsible for uh, developing whatever policies they should have for individuals living within those homes. Of course, through the Office of Student Engagement, uh, we will work with these students to try to help uh, them plan accordingly. And of course, they'll be held accountable for following university and city requirements. Good, thank okay. you, Dave. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the next one, I am a student. Will I be able to do advising and tutoring virtually in the fall? Yeah, we would hope to have those options available. Um, I will just say from the audience, there are a lot of very specific questions about furloughs that we, of course, really don't have the answers for at this time. We will be taking down all of these questions and it will provide us with things to consider as we look at these various options. Good. Th just thank you, Suzanne. That's exactly right. We're, that, that's, that's up next. That's, uh, uh, we began working through that. And again, we want your input on that question. Please feel free to use that president at missouristate.edu email, send any, send into that any thoughts, doesn't even have to be a question. You could send in your thoughts on, 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 on a furlough process. I promise you I will read every single thing you send me. Okay, this is, uh, I don't know that we've addressed this one. Will students with higher health risks have the option to zoom into seated classes? Yeah, great question. I, I think that student would want to go through the disability accommodation uh, process, and that's a potential option. So can't promise that that's just will occur because somebody wants to do it, but that's a potential option that if, if you go through and ask for that kind of accommodation, we'll evaluate. Question about dining halls. Most of the food is self-serve. Are they sanitizing tables and seats after each person or what is the plan? All right, Dr. Cisco, back to you. What Do, do we have a plan yet for dining halls? Uh, yes, we are working closely with Chartwells, who is our food service provider. And uh, they have a number of protocols they're putting in place, including cleaning, looking at how serving will take place, as you know, right now, they're serving food out of Garst as a to-go option. And so there could be a variety of different, uh, I guess, ways in which they might provide food in the future, including social distancing, cleaning protocols, et cetera. All right, thank you. Uh, when we are talking about a hiring freeze, does that include student positions, GAs, et cetera? No. When, Dr. Cisco, when will the Foster Rec Center open? Great question. Um, our auxiliary operations, Campus Recreation Foster Rec Center, the bookstore, the Plaster Student Union are all gearing up to open the 1st of July so that we'll be ready for SOAR, which starts on July the 6th. Good. Will there be a protocol to maintain social distancing within hallways of our buildings? For example, one-way entrance and one-way exit. Uh, Mr. Morris, you wanna take that one? Yes, there will be no specific directional signage. I would tell you though that there will be signage in locations where there's high transaction volume. For instance, the examples would be at the Bursar's office or financial aid where you see long lines. There will be medallions on the floor reminding people to, social, be, to practice social distancing. Also out there on the planning, design and construction web uh, homepage, there are, uh, is a link to signage uh, for social distancing. So I wanna be sure that people are aware of that resource that if you feel, hey, I'm in an area that I wanna remind people about social distancing, there's a boomer bear social distance sign that can be printed and utilized in the various areas. How will study abroad programs be impacted this summer and fall? So uh, we're not doing summer uh, abroad at all. All those trips were canceled, money was refunded. Um, I do not anticipate study away trips for the fall. I think our hope would be that study away could begin again in the summer of 21. Jim Baker, anything you would add to that? No, I think that's, uh, that's true. We also have some study uh, away programs that are domestic. And so we're looking at those based on where the students, where the faculty would be going. But I think there's gonna be very little, very limited travel for uh, study away programs. Maintenance personnel were told if they took two thirds leave, there may not be a position for them when they return. Is this true? 
You know, it's hard. It's hard for me to respond to. I was I was told questions, um, but so so let me just say this: um, we have no plans to lay a single human being off as I sit here today. Uh, and so our strategy, our anticipated strategy, is over the next uh, two month, two and a half months, people on two thirds pay category will return to work. That, as I sit here on May the 20th, that's, uh, that's our plan. But again, there is significant unknowns out there in terms of uh, how much state appropriation reduction, how, what, how big a drop of, en of enrollment we're going to have. But no one on a two-thirds pay category, none of you should assume your job is gone. What are the plans for fully opening the library this summer? Frank, uh, are you aware of that? Um, we're already partially opened. Uh, at this moment in time, the uh, gaining of a book would be you, you order it and you can come into the lobby area at a, at, I think it's three to five in the afternoon. I might have that off by an hour and you can pick it up. Uh, so it's not a go in and search yourself, but we will be opening in stages as we go on in the next few weeks. And uh, it will be limited hours, but those hours will be dependent a lot on the usage we have. If we find there's more usage, then we will extend the hours. So it's already on a partial open basis now. As you know, the computer lab is open that's in the library and the lobby is open and some things on demand are open and the testing center is open. Thank you. Uh, for new students, have there been any changes to the SOAR schedule? Go ahead, Dee. <laughs> Uh, yes, there have been. We have uh, altered our typical two-day overnight SOAR program and changed them to one-day program starting July the 6th. Starting July the 6th, each Monday through Thursday until school starts, we'll offer a one-day SOAR program. Some of those will be on campus. Some of those will be offered um, online. Students will have the option to select which format they would prefer. Of course, we can't do everything uh, that we used to do at SOAR in a two-day program, in a one-day program, but students will come to campus, uh, they'll meet with advisors, they will register for classes, and they'll leave ready to be a bear. Great. If you are scheduled to go back to work on June 1, what is the process to be allowed to reconnect to VPN to also work remotely? Jeff Coiner, you're up. Yeah, yes, thanks, thanks uh, for that question. question. So, so uh, the, the, the process really, really hasn't changed, changed that. that. You, you can request, request uh, access, access to the VPN just by, by uh, contact on the desk, desk, either send them an email, email or, or call, call them, them, and uh, that will get all, all rolling to get you access, access to the VPN. VPN. Well, well there's, there is some irony to the fact that our uh, CIO uh, was the first one to give a garbled response to a question. <laughs> Jeff, you did not come through well. Is there something you could do to try that answer again? I, I will try. I'm in my office, so there's even more. Uh, you're better. You're better now. Go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, so the VPN, to get access to that, you can contact the help desk area, either via email or by calling them and uh, they will get the ball rolling to get you started to, to get that access if you don't have that already. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, back to the air quality question. Uh, will uh, the steps be taken for off-campus buildings such as PCOB, Brick City, et cetera? Matt? Brick City is a university building. We purchased it, and so what I mentioned earlier applies. PCOB, we lease from Davis Properties, and those conversations of what we've been doing have been had with them as well. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, given that we will be receiving international students from all over the world, including China, what plans are in place to receive and settle international students as they arrive for fall semester? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Baker, do you wanna take that one? I know we've got protocols in place for, for those. Yeah, we, uh, we anticipate the, uh, obviously the international enrollments will drop quite a bit. Uh, we, uh, uh, right at this point, we are spending a lot of time developing online options and delaying the arrival of some students, uh, particularly from China. So uh, for our campus there, uh, we have students that will be taking online classes this fall, and then they would transfer in the spring if all things uh, go well. Uh, the university has a, a travel policy in place for uh, uh, international students or people that have come, uh, that are coming back from uh, travel to uh, various hotspots. Uh, that's on the COVID-19 uh, site. It's got all the, uh, the rules. Uh, essentially, what uh, we would anticipate is if we have students come in, they would end up uh, being tested, or at least there would be probably some kind of a short uh, self-isolation that would take place. So we would control the flow of those uh, students in. You know, the other thing I would add to that is many of our Chinese students are going to be studying in China right. uh, for the fall semester because of the difficulty of getting here. And then there's another group of students that never went home. And so many of those students are, are no higher risk than any student living in Springfield. And so, but, but for those coming in, uh, we, we've got special protocols in effect to make sure that, that they're safe and that everyone else is safe as well. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I think that, that most of our international students are already here, that will be here for this fall, I anticipate, because of the travel restrictions taking place. Okay, if a student contracts COVID-19 or is placed in quarantine, will they be excused from coursework sorry, coursework, how would that, how would coursework continue? Um, I, I think that's a question to be helpful to have this, the individual student email us and we will, uh, we will work through that. You know, to some extent, that's a faculty member driven decision as opposed to a central decision. Um, but, but obviously, uh, as we have for the last two months, We've encouraged flexibility with faculty as they manage through with students. But, but if you'd like to send me an email, we'll, we'll get a more specific answer to you um, to the extent that we can. If a student who has signed up to attend in person wants to opt to attend virtually, can they have that option? Well, every class is not set up that way. Um, and so, for example, we're, we're putting several hundred thousand dollars in expanding our Zoom options uh, this fall into 70 large classrooms, but we have many more classrooms than that. And so every, every class doesn't have Zoom capability. Uh, every class doesn't have an internet option. What we have done is extended our internet offerings. There, I think by last count, 920 sections that are offered online. And so to the extent that you prefer internet classes, I would encourage you to schedule those from the beginning. Um, and, and then if you have, uh, you know, if there's a, a health reason that you need to have some kind of alternative um, 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 schedule, uh, then we have a process to work through to, with you individually on that. Are we, have we started planning for next spring as well? And, and what it might look like. You know, I'm still planning for my afternoon today. And so, um, uh, no, we, we honestly, we haven't. We've, uh, uh, we're working really hard to get our reopening and return to campus plans put together in the next several weeks. And then we move to the fall semester um, and, 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 and beginning kind of all of the the detailed planning of that. And then after that, we move into the spring semester. And so, so I'm not prepared to answer any spring semester uh, questions uh, today. Uh, it's a good question, don't get me wrong. It's just the, given the, the overwhelming nature of this issue, we just haven't gotten that far down the timeline. Will the university be increasing student recruitment efforts throughout the summer? 
above and beyond what we normally do to help assure and recruit as many students for this fall as possible? If yes, so, we what are. is that looking like? Yes, we are. Uh, there, there are all sorts of, uh, of, uh, of virtual strategies that we've engaged in with both uh, students that uh, uh, have applied as well as getting uh, students who partially applied to finish up, to, to, uh, to directly interact with students that have applied but haven't sent in a housing department or haven't or deposit or haven't sent in a SOAR department. So there is a ton of one-on-one -on -one activity going on right now with uh, both uh, returning and new students. Um, we also, for the fall, uh, changed our admission criteria to eliminate an ACT or SAT requirement, uh, given that those tests stopped being offered. And so now you can be admitted with a 3.25 grade point. We've widely communicated that um, with counselors and students as well. And so there is a robust uh, opportunity or effort being going on. We're, we're going to roll out soon a return to campus scholarship that if you've been out of, uh, of school for a year and have 90 hours that you can uh, get a partial reduction in cost if you come back and take a certain amount of classes. So lots of recruitment efforts ongoing. You are exactly right. There is nothing more important and this is within our control to a certain extent, there is nothing more important than enrolling students for the fall. Okay, and I, I do wanna make another general statement, not about furloughs, this one is about masks. We're getting a lot of questions about masks, how they can be applied, used, enforced. Um, again, we're still developing our mask policy um, that will continue to evolve over the summer. And we will keep your questions and that will help us as we formulate our policy moving forward. Again, if, if you want to expand on, on that, on your thoughts, send an email, president at missouristate.edu, put the word mask in the subject line. We'll group them all together. We will read them all. Uh, are we considering taking temperatures and having employees fill out health status questionnaires daily? Can supervisors send employees they suspect are ill with COVID symptoms to majors? Yeah, so we're, we're working on a risk assessment survey right now. Uh, the first places it will be used are our residential check-in and student athlete return to campus. Um, so, so we'll be working through that risk assessment question. Um, what was the second part? Oh, temperatures. Um, we're, th that's on the agenda. Uh, again, we're likely to take temperatures of um, uh, returning uh, students who are going to live on campus. We are going, we are likely to take temperatures of returning students over the summer. Um, I'm somewhat hesitant to do a everyone's going to take their temperature every day for employees kind of question. I trust our employees to follow the directive of don't come to work if you have a fever or are sick, but there may be exceptions to that and we're still working through that question for the university as a whole. So I, I will repeat a question that uh, they didn't feel was answered. Uh, how when will faculty who teach large classes be informed uh, about how their class will be delivered? How many rooms do we have that will hold 150 students? Um, is having 150 students in car consider in Carrington considered appropriate social distancing? So Frank, you want to take a stab at that, and then we may ask the uh, the questioner to send us an email. Uh, and we can can respond more directly. Frank, anything else you would add to that question? Well, I would simply say that the department heads have been working with the faculty in the changes that have been made in terms of if they're going to a different modality. If it's simply changing a classroom space, I don't think that's probably always been true. But uh, if they want to change to an internet, or change to a blended, that's been coordinated with any full-time faculty. So again, for, for the specific questioner, and I understand this is a very important question, I would start with your department head, then move to your dean in terms of that. Um, in, in terms of city guidelines, we expect to be um, 
by July in a scenario where 50% uh, capacity of a room is accepted social distancing. And so if Carrington seats 300 people and there were 150 people in there, then that would, uh, that would qualify. But again, I, I don't know if a specific decision on that particular classroom has yet been made. Okay, will custodial staff be in buildings beyond 1230 to keep classrooms and high traffic areas sanitized? Matt? Custodial will continue to operate at the current shifts where it's a 4 a.m. start and then we also are running a third shift as well. So, uh, and again, we're keeping, making sure that our custodial staff is also social distanced while they're in the other facilities as well. So, um, well, what, what are the what are the hours of the shifts, Matt, for custodians? The 4 a.m. to 12:30, and then third shift running through the evening hours. Okay. Overnight. Again, if if uh, if, if as a part of evaluating cleaning that we thought we needed to change that uh, uh, third shift, I think that's an option we could evaluate. Uh, what will be the protocol for shuttle? Okay, that's a Matt Morris question as well. So shuttles are not running during the summer, but we expect to, to, to begin again. Matt, you wanna take that one? We do, August 1st is when new parking permits take effect. It's when we start enforcing parking again, and that is when the shuttle system will begin again. Uh, because of the budget restrictions, uh, we certainly have uh, less fee money coming in that, that fund the transit way. So uh, Transportation Services is working with FISC, our provider of the shuttle system, to review ridership and to make strategic decisions on what shuttles run, how they run to maximize efficiency there. Of course, we will engage with students because uh, they were integral in getting the transit system in place. Are there changes to how the GEP 101 course will be offered? They are, they are going to be all first block classes. Uh, it will be a blended class as well. And our thought there is we want to make sure we get that whole class in, um, in case there is a, a winter uh, return of the virus. And so, so we will have blended GEP 101 classes that meet for the first eight weeks of the fall semester. They will all be like that. What happens to international hires, H-1B visa positions, or permanent residency sponsorships? Nothing happens to them. They're not impacted by this? Not specifically. Okay. Uh, if one of my roommates is quarantined, will I be quarantined as well? And, and then how does being quarantined affect my schoolwork? Uh, David Hall, you're probably not the guy to answer the schoolwork question. And again, we, that, that's, a, that's a decision we would expect faculty to work directly with students to manage through that. We know that's going to happen. We, we do not want to penalize students when that happens. And so again, we will work on those on a case-by-case -case kind of basis. If you want to talk about the isolation or quarantine, if, if uh, you know, somebody in a, in a four-person suite uh, tests positive for COVID. Yeah, so it, it, it all just depends on the specifics of the situation. So the health department is the one who really guides those decisions. But just kind of as, as a general rule, if somebody is um, quarantined, Generally, the reason they're quarantined is because they've been exposed to somebody who has tested positive COVID and that um, or that, you know, they're symptomatic. The other person has been symptomatic. So you're put in quarantine. We would move them out. We would not. But the but the other ones within that resident, they would not necessarily they're called considered a secondary. And so they would not necessarily be quarantined. Uh, as a result of that, it's because you know somebody who then was potentially exposed. If your actual roommate is put in isolation, 
that means that they are symptomatic, which means you'd be a primary uh, exposure. So the health department would require you to be quarantined. So that's where we're looking at that, um, you know, using um, uh, our additional residence hall of the Kentwood in order to be able to move people to that. So it really kind of depends on the specifics of the situation as to whether somebody's in quarantine versus isolation. But, um, you know, so hopefully that answers that person's question. Will the 80 hour employee COVID pay be extended into fall semester? Rachel, um, are you, are you on? Um, remind me, remind me what that policy is. I am. And that policy has already been uh, extended consistent with federal law. Uh, and so that change is already on the website. It runs through December 31st. That's the 80 hours of additional paid leave related to, uh, COVID infection, COVID symptoms while seeking diagnosis, and COVID uh, child care closures necessitating child care at home. Good, thank you. Since Zoom classes can be held from private homes at no additional cost, why is the university spending thousands of dollars to make more classrooms Zoom ready? Frank? Dr. Einhelic? I'm getting there. <laughs> um, well, I think there's a tremendous advantage to having a classroom setting as an initiation spot, and it also will allow for a mixture of some students in the class uh, and some to then be at a distant location and receiving it. Uh, but uh, we're putting in tracking cameras for at least our largest classrooms so they can go to a blackboard uh, or provide things in that uh, kind of format that they could not do just sitting, you know, in their office. Um, and so there are good reasons, I think, to allow the flexibility of the mixture in the class and people at distance or in another room right here on campus. Hey, thank you. I might also add we're, we're thinking that uh, uh, yes, we're going to spend a, a lot of money in that direction. We think it's a long-term gain to the university. Uh, it has extended time, and we do think that this uh, will qualify for uh, federal uh, support in the process. Frank, that's a, that's a tremendously good answer to that, and I, I would uh, tell our group that, that I dropped in on five Zoom classes uh, this semester, two science classes, um, um, two uh, choral classes that had a variety of majors in them and one communications class. And what I saw was very well done. And, and so I, I'm certainly supportive of extending that kind of technology, particularly given the unknowns of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic and how long it's gonna last and whether it recurs. Uh, because there was some really good teaching and interaction d done with faculty in classrooms doing Zoom teaching. Okay. The pandemic has unfortunately caused an increase in the harassment of persons of Asian descent. Is there a protocol in place to ensure the safety of such students and employees on campus? And can you speak to these concerns and where Missouri State stands with regard to it? So, so we're not, we're not going to tolerate anyone being harassed on our campus. And so whether that's uh, harassment because you're wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, whether that's any kind of racial uh, harassment, there's no harassment that's ever going to be tolerated on our campus. I am not aware of any of our Asian students reporting that they have been harassed in Springfield or on campus. Jim, are you? No, I'm not really aware of uh, anything, haven't heard any. Um, we do work a lot with our folks to make sure that if there's anyone that is being harassed, that they report it to us and we'll follow up on it. Uh, like President Smart says, we simply won't tolerate that type of uh, harassment for folks. Uh, personally, I've not really received any. Uh, I can check and we can follow up with the uh, International Programs Office and, and make sure that we uh, are keeping on top of this. 
but we have students from a lot of different places. And so there, there's always potential for harassment. The thing that I will say is that we've been very lucky and very fortunate that uh, the International Friends Program, people have been very, very, very supportive of our international students. So we've been very pleased with that. We, we had an outpouring of support for our international students. We created a virtual international friend policy. My wife, Gail, volunteered for that. Literally 100 new people volunteered for that. And so I think our team has done a really good job supporting our international students. Um, but there is never a type of harassment that is acceptable to any part of the university community. And we would enforce our rules on that vigorously. Okay, travel restrictions are set to expire June 30. Will any new restrictions or guidelines be put in place? Also, currently the restriction is 150 miles. Is this a total of 150 miles or a radius of 150 miles? Uh, yeah, it's one way out and one way back. Uh, so it allows you to go to West Plains, for example. Um, that's going to go through June 30. Again, a great example of why reading inside Missouri State and Cliff Notes is really important because we rolled that out, I believe, yesterday. Um, new travel policy will kick in July 1. Um, and, and so for university travel, uh, the 150 mile radius is taken off and it becomes a anywhere in Missouri travel policy. Uh, and beyond that would have to have approval either through the academic side or the non-academic side you know, as we move out of the current policy, which was focused primarily on safety, we're moving into a policy that is focused on cost containment primarily. And so for university travel, frankly, given the budget hole we expect, there's gonna be more scrutiny in terms of travel, uh, but the 150 mile radius is coming off at the end of June. Okay, thank you. What has happened with the larger strategic enrollment management plan that was such a big focus earlier? Will there, will there still be a priority put on SEM related projects? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, it's on hold. Uh, when when uh, we changed the, the, the method of operation the uh, second week of March, that was one of the things I met with Dr. Cisco and Dr. Einhellig and Rob Hornberger and we decided it made sense to put a hold on that. Uh, the steering committee continued to work on retention and recruitment efforts in the short term, but long-term work was halted, in part because the whole makeup of our student body may be very different in the fall, and we thought we needed a reset on that. We will begin working on it again in the fall, and it will become a part of working on our long-term plan as well, which uh, will be in its last year. And so, yes, it, it will resurface. It remains absolutely critical. Uh, we just moved our focus into short-term recruitment and retention efforts, uh, given all of the other things all of the people working on these committees had now have responsibility for. Will plexiglass partitions be used in computer labs, reception areas? Who will be responsible to put them in? So that policy is uh, rolling out next week. Matt, do you want to address where plexiglass is going and who's going to install them? Yes, and, and a great resource is that planning, design, and construction website I referenced earlier. But uh, planning, design, and construction has evaluated largely transaction-based areas uh, where paper is being pushed and there's face-to-face -face interaction. Those are category ones. Those are funded. Uh, through a centralized budget. Also then, if any reasonable accommodations are approved through the process outlined earlier, plexiglass will also be installed there through a centralized fund. Anywhere else that's not categorized in that area, it falls to the department if they want to fund plexiglass or not. Um, again, to get a, a handle on who, where it's going and where it's not, Planning, Design, and Construction, Mark Wheeler, University Architect, is spearheading that. He has reached out to those areas that are Category 1s. And again, any questions about plexiglass can be geared directly to Planning, Design, and Construction. We, we've, we've got about 15 more minutes that we can do questions. I think uh, probably three hours is enough for anyone. If we don't get your question answered in the next 15 minutes, again, Send me an email, 
I will make sure it's responded to. And uh, we're getting near the end. I will say there were a lot of very specific questions with regard to faculty. And I would recommend you send in an email for those questions as well. We, uh, will, we will get those to the provost to disseminate. Uh, and so any particular faculty academic question, again, send them to the president, president at missouristate.edu. Put, put something in the subject line that identifies it's an academic question. We'll get those to the provost's office. He'll either answer them or get them to your dean who will respond. We'll get all questions answered by the end of next week. That'll be our goal. And we're also saving the questions from the Q&A, so we'll have those reference as well. Um, I do have another question. If a student tests positive, will faculty be notified that the student was present in their class? Well, what will be the protocol for the rest of the students who might have been exposed in the class? Again, that, that comes down, I think David Hall addressed this earlier, that's, a, that's an individual situation. We work with the Greene County Health Director. They do contact uh, tracing. You know, a person sitting on the front row of a class is likely not infecting someone sitting on the back row. So they analyze that particularly, they, they track all of that down and they give us guidance and directive on how to manage that. Clearly the faculty member would be notified. We had a couple of situations in March where that occurred. And again, we worked with the faculty member uh, and Greene County Health Department to do the contract tracing and to notify people that might have been subject to exposure. I might add that uh, we are discussing uh, working with faculty about the advisability of uh, assigned seating after they have a week or so of class so that uh, it is known what your neighbors were in close proximity. And uh, that's been suggested and it's a good suggestion. So we're going to at least have the discussion about that. Thank you. And that, that helps make the contract contact tracing easier if we know with specificity the three or four people sitting around the person that's tested positive. When will we be allowed to bring student employees back to work? Can they work on campus this summer? So that is up to each cost center head. That's not a central decision. Uh, there are already units that are utilizing student workers, for example, in tutoring, et cetera. So again, that's something you should bring up with your cost center head, your department head, your dean, um, your vice president, et cetera. There have been a couple of questions. So I'm going to uh, bundle it for uh, Dr. Ian Hellig. Um, how does this affect sabbaticals? Uh, that are currently planned or on the schedule? And how will the funding continue in fiscal year 21 and 22? Um, sabbaticals are funded out of each cost center separately. They are not centrally funded. And um, I've had communication from some cost center heads um, about specific sabbaticals. And it's my understanding that it's kind of a case by case. Some people have actually requested to, and those are the ones I've had the uh, communication on, requesting to delay it because they don't want to go where they had planned to be. Uh, so I think uh, every scenario is a little different and uh, that'll be worked out with uh, the Dean of the college. Thank you. Uh, this is one of those, we really hope it doesn't happen. If Kitwood happens to become full, uh, what is our plan B as a uh, uh, as residential housing for uh, students who test positive? Well, I think at that point, we would be evaluating if we wanted to shut the university down for a period of weeks. I know I have missed questions. And again, uh, we, we've had uh, huge participation, close to 300 questions, which is why I was doing a little bit of editing and combining. So my apologies, apologies if you feel that your questions weren't answered. Again, we are saving all the questions and uh, we will be responding to them as we can. I, I believe our commitment is by, Cliff, you said the end of next week? End of next week. Okay. All right, so again, uh, let's, uh, let me just wrap it up. We still have 619 
uh, hardy individuals on the call. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling in today. Thanks for really good discussion, good feedback on the survey. Um, I, I just wanna reassure everyone, our whole team is working as hard as we can to make the best decisions for the long-term uh, strength of the university. And so you help us when you send us information. We, we will read everything we get. This kind of town hall was, was very helpful to get a sense of what you're thinking and what issues there are left to resolve. Um, but but um, um, this, is, this is a challenging year. We will get through it. Uh, and, and if we pull together and work hard, our students will get through it and we'll come out of this um, a stronger university. Um, so again, thanks for joining us today. Uh, more information to come down the road. Thanks for everyone who participated in the call. And uh, with that, I'm gonna leave the meeting.